the 10th day of November 2014 and Alok is with us again Samaskar. and uh, today we're going to talk about uh, India from the time of the birth of Sri Aurobindo 1872 142 years yes um, once again you <laughs> Bring me before an ocean. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you see, um, I'm just sharing how I look at it. Shurbindo's, there is a background to Shurbindo's birth. And just as there is a foreground to it and, you know, things of the future. And just to take on from what you were speaking about India, you know, during our previous meeting. Yes. So India has been a land of a grand spiritual experiment, chosen for that. But for a long time, this spiritual experiment took place within defined geographical boundaries because it was necessary. And the physical aspects of India are also like that, Himalayan border and seas on the three sides. Now things are different. We have all kinds of, you know, means of access into other countries, even without sending a vehicle because now it's a cyber war age of that or a cyber journey, but for a long time it remained protected, but it was not yet one nation. And it was the gift of Sri Krishna that he created a nation unit within India, or called India. I mean, he didn't call it India, but Shubhendra says that this was one of the offshoots of the Mahabharata war, to put India together as one unit. And uh, the way it was created was through the, you know, idea of Chakravarti Samrat and, you know, Ashwamed Yabhi, etc. We will not go into that, but each of them is a very fascinating thing. But after that, India was in a way ready to go into the world at large and to allow the world at large into its own boundaries. Because before that, it would have been uh, disastrous. But this same grand spiritual experiment which was taking place in the time of the Vedas, the Upanishads, the Gita, the Tantra, etc. We see as happens with anything which is moving in one direction. While in that age of the Vedas, Upanishads and particularly the Gita, there is an emphasis on um, the world and the self together. They are not regarded as strictly antagonistic. But this launching into the grand experiment eventually led to a kind of uh, pursuit which it's my word i use the word spiritual extremism you know we we have heard about religious extremism and which is <laughs> of course very bad and <laughs> bad is a very mild word <laughs> but spiritual extre extremism can be equally dangerous in fact uh, if we look into the roots it is spiritual extremism which eventually leads to a kind of religious extremism, fundamentalism. In the sense, a whole line of spiritual pursuits started going deeper and deeper and further and further into the search of the spirit. And it kept on removing all the layers of mind, life, body and everything else, all the concepts, ideas, thoughts of the mind through which we operate, all the frames, and landed itself into something called as pure existence, Sadekam. Now, this is there even in Vedanta, but Vedanta never took this kind of an extreme pursuit. It carried the world together through the gods and the gods fulfilling man. Again, Upanishads speaking of this is that, the Gita, of course, very bold synthesis, Tantra. But then when this happened, particularly with Buddha and Shankara, though they seem to be <laughs> you know, at least Shankara thought that he is uh, negating the effects of Buddhism because Buddhism came to be regarded later on mistakenly as, um, you know, it was not a Vedic thought. But what Buddha broke were the Vedic rituals and the systems of thought, the philosophies. He brought back the truth. But Shankara opposed it but ended up in the same cul-de-sac of Sadekam but even that did not satisfy pure existence. So what is beyond pure existence? From where has even pure existence come up? So they went into the unmanifest, avyaktam, also called as non-being, asad. 
and Shobindo and even Christian mystics see it, it was an influence world over. They speak about a state of darkness, holy darkness, sacred darkness, yes. within which broods the spirit, which is very different from the darkness that of ignorance that we experience. It is a holy ignorance if one likes, you know. Uh, and that led to a sudden deprivation and depletion of all the energies which were engaged in the divine work oh. or work in creation. So it led to a division on one side people who were exploring the spirit who had nothing to do with the world at large, with politics, with life, with its manifold pursuits. On the other hand, this field was left completely in the hands of the darkness and what better you know, the very energies that the great ones like Sri Krishna, Christ and Buddha brought down to earth, they used those very energies to perpetuate the darkness. So, you know, that gave birth to religious fundamentalism because, you know, uh, the spiritual teachers took that course. They didn't teach human beings to correct course, how religion can be a step towards that, how, you know, there are different ways through which we can integrate life and the spirit. Uh, this is the background of Shurabindo's coming. A world divided between two completely opposite tendencies. On one side, great lineage of saints all over the world we see, particularly documented in Christian mystics. Even there were Sufi mystics around that time and what is called as the medieval ages, uh, opposing which came the so-called age of rational enlightenment, which is a um, you know, it's a paradox, but anyways, uh, scientific and rational enlightenment on one side, which took care of the affairs of the world. And on other side, the mystic who had nothing to do with the world. So you see, this was an extreme state of division. And therefore, the world was plunged into a darkness as never before. So how did England come in to rule so many with so few? Exactly. One reason, because the spiritual founds which had sustained India through the ages of the Vedas, Upanishads and the Gita, where it's so amazing that even in something like battlefield, in archery, politics, administration, it was done through a spiritual consciousness. Even there were, you know, equipments, instruments, flying machines, everything. Even the arrows and bows, they were all connected in some way to the spiritual pursuit and the warriors were tapasvis. Arjuna was a tapasvi, he had conquered sleep, thirst, food. That's how he could master such weapons. But then once Buddhism and you know Shankara's Shankara, Vedanta yeah. came in, it is a one side you know affirmation of truth. It led to a depletion or a disconnect leading to a depletion of all the spiritual energies which withdrew from the earth scene. And quite naturally, then India was helpless because its spirit has gone, its strength has gone. It was like a dead, dead body. And what is what? What does it take to, you know, uh, rule over a, a land which is almost half dead? The very fount of energy had gone. So first we see one after another invasion start. The Greek invasion, the Portuguese, the French. And then, of course, we have um, two major invasions, the Mughals. Yes. And then we have the uh, England coming in. But in the larger plan, this was necessary. At one level, India refused to worship Shakti and therefore Shakti abandoned her. This is what Shirobindo says. But on the other hand, this was the only way that the world could come in contact with India at large. India would never, you know, aggress beyond its boundaries and uh. conquer other lands. So, you know, Britishers came in and very often people talk about, you know, they looted um, this diamond and that jewelry. That's a small issue. I mean, any country which goes into another does these things. Nothing unusual. But what they looted and to their advantage and to India's advantage is the wealth of the spirit. You see how the Gita found its way into the West. It was through the loot. It's amazing <laughs> that among the yeah. spoils, there was one of the copy of the Gita. And I forget now the full history, but it came in the hands of, you know, 
either Imarsan or you know one of those yeah. and they were surprised that look this this is what kind of a land is this there is such a wealth as was never known so this contact was necessary not just for India's you know people have a mistaken idea that you know it united India no that's not true India as a nation existed and the kings were like you know we have states today they were united by a common cultural bond there was no such problem but on one level modernization but modernization was taking place everywhere even if the Britishers didn't come eventually modernization would take place as we know today you know the earth is flat what happens at one place even the terrorist finds his way through the nukes so you know the world is like that you can't for a long time isolate scientific discoveries uh, from the rest of the world but what happened in the bargain that the West came in touch with the Indian spirit and India which had lost its contact with matter was compelled to look again at matter because that was the strength of Europe now of course America has you know gone far ahead but that was the strength and this was part of the gods part of God's plan and therefore for a long time despite heroic persons you know Jhansi Rani which is supposed to be one of the incarnations of uh, uh, the mother Vibhutis at least and Nana Fadnavis and uh, Tantya Tope many such heroes but it didn't work out it was needed needed for some time so it pulled India back just like an individual yoga it was the yoga of Indian nation India's tapasya started in utter darkness and the avatar had to and come. the avatar has to come so in India there is a tradition that the avatar comes in the hour of deepest darkness it's a moment of crisis but the nature of the crisis is spiritual and this is what we see with Shurabindo that while everybody was engaging with the surfaces oh they have come and they are you know different people and they have different laws rules regulations let's try to find a way to adjust oh we are useless people why because well the Britishers say so or no we are going to fight and revolt against them but Shurabindo took a very different line of approach he used this as an occasion to remind Indians of their innate spiritual strength. He said, you conquer this, all the rest will be given to you. This was his approach. So it was not just, you know, a fight with an external enemy. It was simultaneously a fight with an inner enemy, which Shobindu was constantly pointing out. That you lost Shakti. Therefore, the Britishers came. And if you don't once again regain Shakti in this land of, you know, Shakti worshippers, then if Britishers go away by some, uh, you know, uh, providence or freak chance, the Chinese will come in, somebody else will come in because you are deprived of Shakti. Right. So we see in Shubindu's action upon the country, which uh, I mean is so much in contrast with someone like Gandhi or, you know, Nehru and other, many others, mm. Gokhale, Ranade, who were also great towering figures, no doubt. He started awakening India to the inner Shakti and with that power, with that strength to face Britishers, not as enemies. That's not the way. He was Shubindu before he came to Pondicherry had realized the yoga of the Gita, the Upanishads and the Vedantic truths and we know that very well. But because this land now needs to be independent so that it can fulfill its great role which was as the mother put it to be the spiritual guru of the world. So his coming and then mother coming with all that background which is far more complex maybe you know some other day we should speak about it mm. because to speak of mother is <laughs> simply to be drowned in her love and grace and light but this is the background of Shirobindo's work and during that period constantly the first thing he awakens is the sense of India as a goddess so and he said he incidentally gave this uh, solution even for the unity and very interesting that solution is gradually coming through after nearly a hundred years when people asked him about you know the Hindu Muslim unity and the problem you know it's strange some people believe that Shobindu did very little for Hindu Muslim unity you know he touched it and there are several places we have spoken very eloquently about it in one of his writings he says very interestingly he says that well unity will come if the Indians, regardless of religion, caste, creed, 
begin to regard India as a living mother. Because if you look at it as a piece of land, well, people fight in a piece of land, especially if they are different, then they are bound to fight. It's what is called as lower nature. They are bound to fight. What happens when brothers fight? It's only when, as long as, you know, very often seen that it's a common thing in India, I don't know about other places, that brothers and sisters stay together as long as parents are there. And when they are gone, they fight. They fight over piece of land, they fight over money, they fight over everything. Now, it's a symbol. As long as we regard a nation, not just as a piece of land, but, you know, something for our personal utility, but as mother, as a living goddess, then whatever our difference is, we stay together. Because she is a living entity. But when she becomes a piece of land, then it's natural that, you know, each... Uh, uh, person with a different language, uh, you know, different uh, mindset is bound to fight with other ideas, ideologies, which we see happening today. So Sri gave the radical answer to the problem that love India, regard her as mother, as a living goddess. And the rest is history, you know, you know how he inspired the word Bande Matram right. and um, how he would uh, even came Munshi much later, he would, you know, remember that how he would make us that image of India come alive and that's why Durga's throat uh, which Sri wrote in the beginning of the previous century is not just one of these throtras written it's an invocation once again to mother India that look realize who you are you are Durga you are capable of freeing yourself you are the light that grows in the east you are at once wisdom and hope and strength and beauty incarnate. And therefore he awakened India. And once India, the mother awakens, people will awaken. Instruments will be created. Men like Gandhi will come on the scene and do that last bit. The work was done by Sri So when he came to Pondicherry, uh, you know, again, uh, another misconception that why did he come away? <laughs> why did he escape <laughs> and leave the scene? And Shobindo very beautifully says that it was not an escape. Why he came away was, one, he had already laid the larger lines along which India will regain her independence. We spoke about Swaraj. Now the word Swaraj meant two things, inner mastery. And then, as a result of it, outer mastery. So he talked about Swaraj, and that's why he used the word Poon Swaraj in a very, very beautiful way, like the Vedic Rishis, with a double sense, at once intrinsic and external. Just as he used the word Aryan in a very, very deep sense, not in the superficial mm. sense of a racial type or you know a physiognomy, etc. So he spoke about the Poon Swaraj. He also spoke about you know, all the later on, when we read through the Bande Matram, we see all the other things which came up, which Gandhi used as an instrument, were basically inspired by Sri He had done that bit. Second, he saw that now that India will be free, it is going to be free, the lines have been laid, it is predestined. He was more concerned what it will do with its freedom, because freedom comes with a heavy price. And that price is responsibility. You see, sometimes people don't realize such distorted ideas of freedom. Look at, I think yesterday and few days back, it has been in the news. Uh, there is a big, uh, not a very big one, but uh, there is a movement on freedom to kiss on the street. Mm. Well, <laughs> it's at one level, it's pure, it's childish. <laughs> but at another level, when you look at it, well, that's not really freedom and that's not love. It is not a kiss of love. It's it's an exhibition. Call it what, whatever you know you want, whatever it is. Love is something so deep. It's so full of sacrifice. I mean, I was reading story of Vidyavati Kokil and I was so touched. She was married to a man at 16. This is a centenary, by the way. Mm. Look what kind of human beings have lived once. And within a couple of years, she came to ashram. Her husband told her about Mother and Sri She came and lived here throughout. She did not go back. And he supported her throughout. When she was in her 80s, she fell seriously ill. And there was nobody to, you know, take care of. Ashram takes care, but you know, 
it's not a personalized care and we are talking of you know somewhere in the 80s this man in his 85 years of age came all the way looked after her with the same love so much so that she wrote a poem on him that what shall i call you shall i call you my husband but you are a yogi you have lived like a yogi now you see this is love it's not just about the exhibition outwardly which is okay it's an aspect of love as i said last time india has experimented with everything and it has its own deeper truths but that apart this love which is the true spirit so sure bindu was concerned what india will do with his freedom look what happened to moses famous slaves who got free <laughs> and what they did he had to come back with the 10 commandments freedom is very very big responsibility ashram mother and shubhin the built it on freedom absolutely makes it so delightful and so dangerous <laughs> sometimes you wish <laughs> no mother you should have simply said do this don't do this but then that won't be evolution so evolution is based on freedom and therefore it is hazardous so shubhin the second reason why he came because he was concerned what india will do nobody was thinking about it nobody was worried about it they thought if we gain freedom everything is fine but shubhin the saw in it the seeds and the possibility of gunda raj bolshevism things look ominous he wrote to nirodha yeah. in 30s i think 32 or 33 yeah the third thing is he had seen that well india will become free india will once again perhaps regain its old pristine glory but is it enough the world is kind of interconnected so it's not enough that some people in india like an elite group in ancient times we had you know the brahmins and the kshatriyas who were guardians of spiritual treasures that's not enough why should it be with a chosen few the yoga has to now be spread into the entire mankind now that has to be india's gift and this was the third reason why he came to start this new yoga where for the first time we see an entire collectivity being involved or taken up in the process of yoga but this collective experiment was not in terms of numbers it's not like oh the yoga has to be everybody has to uh, regard shurbindo as the greatest no that's not the way that's a religious way but every sample of humanity he brings to the ashram all the types of people and he starts a little experiment where does the experiment end well not really end but the experiment which starts with a handful of representatives in the ashram develops into the many sided many countries people of different nationalities coming together in oroville and now goes beyond the boundaries of oroville into the world at large so this was shubindo's way to at once awaken the spiritual consciousness of india which had got lost at some point because of an extreme experiment buddha and shankara much more shankara because yeah. buddha has been misunderstood buddha still talked about compassion and the eightfold path the dharma yes, yes. but with shankara there is a complete annulment of this word it is something you know of course at one level amazing it's not easy <laughs> but at another level it is very dangerous it depleted yeah. india sri arbindo has written written about it yeah. shankara's mayavad Yeah. whether shankara meant it this way or that way is it matter of debate but its effect was a total depletion of energies i think that's how we have to look at shubindo's role and of course you mentioned about the crips proposal and last time we spoke about india not just as a geographical unit but as a cultural spiritual and psychological unit mother has named the flower <clears throat> this interested work done for the divine yes and the crips proposal to me was yes he spoke about it yes when he sent shrinivas ayengar yes and oh durai swami here i'm sorry durai swami durai right. swami here and um, he said that accept its grace which has come to our doors literally what more can one say but uh, the then congress which obviously you know did not take heed 
not only to what mother has said but sages and saints in india have said always that regard the word of the rishi as an apt vakya praman don't then try to logicize when a seer speaks leave aside the avatar and the other aspect of shurbindo the, the least everybody agrees upon is that shurbindo is a seer when a seer sees and speaks it is a proof in its own right just accept it because he has seen something which we are not able to see and gandhi ji one can understand his problems and issues because of his strong or rather rigid ideas about external non violence it's not buddhist non violence mm -hmm. which is a very powerful thing buddhist non violence is born of tremendous compassion immobility it's powerful strong whereas the gandhian non violence is inwardly you are vibrating with even hatred and anger but externally you are manifesting nothing it's very dangerous dangerous for both for those who have harbor it and for those who are going to be its recipient because it's it is of course a storm it's like you know i keep telling the other day there was uh, a little incidents but that apart not going into the details so i was explaining to uh, these people i said you know when a woman is angry when she you know throws a tantrum it is easy to handle but when she is silent <laughs> it is dangerous <laughs> men can't take it <laughs> they break down <laughs> this is speak something even if you are angry speak it out <laughs> but if you are silent it is power so he used that it's a misuse of a psychological thing yeah. but it's not a spiritual way because it hurts very badly those creating further reactions and it hurts you also because deep inside you harboring a fire which will burn you inside so the result of it we know now you see that kind of a control over rajasic forces of anger hatred what is what did it lead to the next phase of the yoga of the nation intense release of rajasic energies post independence shubhendra had foreseen it because you know everybody got into that movement well it was allowed for the sake and they suppressed all these rajasic feelings shubhendra didn't say that during shubhendra's when shubhendra was actively involved he said okay fine if you want to fight fight no problem he did not advocate violence he did not advocate non violence but there were people who would express itself in this way and fine but what gandhi did was he suddenly made people swallow that anger hatred now when britishers were gone where will this anger and hatred go it got directed against each other we had a divided country we had partition and yes, aftermath yes. and all that and this was a bad psychology in the bargain it came back upon gandhi himself so you know he obviously he was a poor psychologist he was an instrument no doubt among the great instruments who led to india india's freedom but that does not should not blind us to the fact that it was a very limited understanding of nature psychology and the most fatal mistake was when because of these differences he knew that shobindo has a different line of thought and um, he even wanted to meet shobindo and that time shobindo has yeah. not seen all that is history but probably he couldn't put it aside and look at shobindo just as a seer at least who has seen something he could have asked him but he simply the whole congress along with him rejected it saying it's a post dated check what crips proposal is yeah yeah a fatal fatal error and i think um, if i am not mistaken sir stanford crips did uh, understand and he appreciated that there is at least one man in india who is able to see behind appearances mani ben used to tell me about she talk at length about sadra patel mm -hmm. that sri arbindo saw him Yes, yes, huh? yes. He had come, and yes. there was also a talk. And Shubhendu regarded him as yes. surely one man who was truly a strong leader, yes. a genuine leader, and a committed leader. And I am glad that now you know his legacy is coming up, yes. uh, and also a much ignored leader. See, it's been the yes. uh, unfortunate <clears throat> part that post uh, again Nehru and especially his daughter Indra were in their own right wonderful people. but that apart the legacy that they left see again it became like there were some who were givers some who were receivers 
see that kind of politics which started appeasing oh we will give you dolls it's not the way you have to equip people to recover their own strength their own energies again they got popularized they started getting popularized nobody was bothered you know okay they were looking at the government for the policies which can uh, grant them quotas reservations you know money this is not the way and they got into that mode like a raja mm. with all good intentions probably i mean nehru was had his limitations but i do believe he was a man of good will he was limited in his understanding uh, probably under the influence of gandhi but his and unfortunately towards the end later part he really really dwindled again indra a very strong personality and she did a lot of good but again stumbling with his own speed again she made that mistake of not listening to mother's advice during the 71 war yeah and mother had said that india must fight and she had made it clear that it must take over pakistan it must fight to the finish yeah. and indian army was right up to karachi and lahore yeah but she said who will manage all these people <laughs> maybe a genuine concern but when the divine says just obey and see and she believed in mother she had come here yeah, received her yeah, darshan many times yes, yeah yes. that's the irony and mother had imposed it trust in her mother has spoken highly of uh, indra ji mm-hmm. and no doubt she was a wonderful lady but see look hap- what happened after that yeah. soon after that we see emergency problems of refugees naxal movement and eventually her own death so you see what happens when an instrument is open to the divine and works and the day now there are instruments which are consciously open she was not among the consciously open instrument but she was an instrument but when you lose that opportunity so shurbindo gave this message to for the crips proposal it was not accepted and the consequences we know you know the division the hatred the bitterness we are still reeling under it actually we are still at out of it and god knows another 50 years 20 years it will take to really uh, arrive at some kind of a semblance of uh, india recovering back the parts but it's something more than nishkam karma because shubhendu was asked this you are trikal darshi you know this is going to happen why did you allow it to have why did you send an emissary so this is the common conception that the divine if he knows everything <laughs> he will do only where he is bound to succeed and shubhendu says uh, why shouldn't the divine fail <laughs> yes. what if failure suits his purpose well at one place he says the world has changed by just about half a dozen revolutions and most of these were failures in their own time look at the french revolution and it's now that people are picking up that thread of you know fraternity equality <laughs> but during that time what a mess and a chaos it created so much of bloodshed oh. so you know divine yet acts why because even for an individual at one place shubhendu says even if you knew that there is certain failure still you must act because by action the means increase so it's like the divine puts his hand on this side of the scales today or tomorrow this is going to be because he has added in the play of forces a force which is going to be an eternal and immortal force because what he has said see gandhi nehru indra many others have come and gone and will go away but the word of the eternal will continue to remain and stir the hearts of mankind because it is the word of the imperishable so i look at it like this that his action was yes nishkam karma of course that even when you know that you know one nishkam karma is where we don't know the results and we dedicate the result but the nishkam karma of a yogi who knows the result and yet acts now that's of a different category altogether he knows this is going to be a failure but a failure for the present yet it will pave the way for the future that line in savitri where he speaks about fate o king thy fate is a transaction done 
between nature and thy soul and then he says uh, that he writes oh, thy this, refusal yeah, in, in, the in the credit page, page. In the credit page. <laughs> but doom is not a close a mystic yes. seal it's not a close yes. it's not a seal he writes thy refusal in the credit page arisen from the tragic crash of life arisen from the death and defeat the spirit rises mightier with each defeat, its godlike wings grow wide with every fall. So you see, this is how it goes on. And Shubhendu said, even if I knew that the world would smash, I would look beyond the smash to the new creation. I think this is the spirit that all of us must harbor. Yes. Regardless of whatever is happening all around, regardless of, you know, ISIS and Ukraine and, mm. <laughs> and America and... Bosnia and Somalia and everything else and India of course the melting pot <laughs> we must look beyond the smash towards the new creation which is bound to be